welcome to CARE's series on decolonizing anti-racist interventions. That uh, universities themselves, their structures, forms, processes, and practices of knowledge production are deeply racist and colonial, these are often intertwined, is the starting point of the conversations in this series. In our ongoing conversations at CARE, we have grappled with the question then, how do we decolonize the university, acknowledging that universities are embedded in practices that silence, erase, and oppress many voices, particularly voices that seek to build anti-racist interventions. It is therefore my great honor to welcome none other than Professor Leoni Pihama as the plenary speaker for this series. When thinking about someone that would sort of offer us light in terms of, and guidance in terms of connecting academia and activism, I couldn't think of anyone better than Professor Pihama. For so many of you, including myself, she's a source of thinking to turn to when imagining a politics of decolonization. And yes, decolonization is uh, deeply political. And for many, uh, the pay uh, with their bodies, with their uh, careers, uh, when doing the work of decolonization. A visionary in the conversation on the struggle for decolonizing the academe, she is director of the Te Kotahi Research Institute at the University of Waikato, the host for the highly regarded Hemanawa Fenua Indigenous Research Conference. She is also the director of Maori and Indigenous Analysis Limited, a Kaupapa Maori research company. Her path-breaking work with Kaupapa Maori offers a conceptual framework for what the struggle for decolonization looks like, clearly articulating the basis for this work in undoing the colonial structures of the university. What I personally find so inspiring about Dr. Piham and I follow her, or rather I uh, make sure that I keep updated with her uh, tweets on social media, uh, is the way in which uh, her practice is deeply intertwined with her theoretical interventions. You know, this idea that theory and practice ought to be uh, separated from each other itself is a colonial idea uh, that reproduces sites of eraser. She has served on Maori television's establishment board and worked in film and media production. And in late 2013, she was appointed as a director on the Te Managai Paho board. She was also a former director of the International Research Institute of Maori and Indigenous Education and Director of Maori and Indigenous Analysis Limited, an independent Maori community research company. Dr. Pihama has established a capacity building program in collaboration with uh, Dr. Sarah Jen Tiakiwai, Director of Waikato Tainui Research and Development College, which has supported Kaupapa Maori theory and research training for over 230 people. As I said, I draw inspiration from the publicness of her decolonizing work. Her tweets are a model for what activist transformation looks like. A tweet itself can be a theoretical anchor. You see that when you follow her tweets. Inconvenient conversations can be started through the publicness of these works. And we must have these conversations if we are serious about creating universities in anti-racist imaginaries. So in this sense, the work of anti-racism is not elsewhere, is what I learned from uh, Dr. Pihama, but rather it is right here in the university, in the academe. In Dr. Pihama's call to bring activism into academe as the site where we must agitate to decolonize and transform, I find the theoretical roots for CARE's ongoing work on delineating a politics of anti-racist solidarity. Yes, solidarity is so important, especially where Universities turn us into individuals competing against each other, often pitted against each other. And this solidarity perhaps is the basis for an ongoing decolonizing project. So here, uh, Panao, friends, colleagues, troublemakers, Professor Leoni Panama. Kia ora tātou. Uh, tūtahi mahi tēnā ki te haukainga, a rangitāni tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. 
Tēnā koutou i manaki mai a mātou i noho nei ongi tō koutou whenua i tēnei wā. Um, ki ngā hapu, ki ngā iwi, ki ngā maunga, ki ngā awa, uh, ki ngā moana e wainganu i atā tō i tēnei. Hui hui ngā i tēnei atā, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. <coughs> so I just want to preface this with, um, I have a flu, so I have magic homeopathic drops that I'll use occasionally through this conversation. Um, so I wanted to firstly uh, remember today uh, those that were murdered and maimed in Christchurch six weeks ago um, in Ōtautahi on March uh, the 15th. It's now six weeks since 50 lives were taken by white terrorism, lives of daughters, sons, Brothers, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, cousins, aunties, uncles, friends, colleagues, partners and community members. We read daily now of the survival of many others, including children that were seriously injured in an act of terrorism driven by white supremacy, xenophobia, Islamophobia and hatred. And I also want to acknowledge the murder of over 250 people in Sri Lanka as a result of yet another form of terrorist attack. So today and every day, our whānau send aroha to all of those whānau impacted. One of the things around what happened in Christchurch that came to the fore was what is the role that we have as Māori, as tangata whenua, to manaki those who seek refuge on our land. That's a part of the broader decolonising agenda that we need to engage. Most recently I've been watching Maya Angelou and I'm going through some of her earlier work. In one of her videos she said, when I decided to speak, I had a lot to say. In that one line she was speaking of the denial of her voice as a black woman. As a black child who grew up in a racially segregated context, referred to now in colonial terms as America, and that white li one line, she also speaks to the power of white privilege in having voice, and the privilege of particular speakers and voice dependent on race and gender. In this country, we experience daily the privilege of white authoritarian voice. It serves to reproduce racism through a process where the white authority informs us not of only of who we are, but of our experiences and of our history and of our deficiencies in understanding these things. We live in a country that, as Taika Waititi so eloquently stated, is racist as fuck. Yet many in this country continue to live in a state of denial. A denial of Aotearoa as Māori land, as hapu land, as iwi land, as whānau land. A denial of Māori as tangata whenua. A denial of the invasion and occupation of these lands. A denial of the crown to honour the treaty. A denial that white colonial supremacist racist ideologies underpin the society that is referred to as New Zealand. A denial that white supremacy, white entitlement and white privilege are sources in racist oppression. But this is not new and this should not be surprising. This is what we as Tangata Whenua have lived with since 1642 when Abel Tasman was the first to impose this Eurocentric imperialist privilege through seeking to rename our islands to now being referred to as New Zealand. What is deeply saddening is that these denials have enabled many white terrorist murders and attacks in both contemporary and historical terms. Last week, the Prime Minister announced a Royal Commission to investigate how it was so easy for a white supremacist to enter this country. 
to arm himself with semi-automatic weapons and to wreak racist havoc on the Muslim community on March 15th. The Royal Commission will, Prime Minister Ardern states, ensure that no stone is left unturned and will play a critical role in our ongoing response to fully understand what happened in the lead up to the attack and to ensure that such an attack never happens again. The Commission will have a number of focuses in its brief. Looking at the individual's activities before the attack and relevant information from his time in Australia, his arrival and residence here, his travel here, how he obtained a gun licence, his connections, what relevant agencies knew about this individual. The list goes on. As a part of the conversation around the Royal Commission, Rebecca Kitteridge from the SIS, standing alongside the GCSB, Andrew, uh, GCSB's uh, manager, Andrew Hampton, were asked whether or not they'd been too focused on Islamic extremism, to which she responded, were focused on extremist behaviours of all kinds. So it's ideology neutral. What we do respond to is the presenting threat in society that was not just extremism promoted by Sunni extremism, for example. The statement that the government's spy agencies are ideology neutral highlights the embedded nature of the racism within the so-called intelligence services. And I use the word intelligence very carefully. The recently released, uh, released police list of designated terrorist entities shows that the spy industry here is entirely ideologically based. It is also entirely ideologically biased. And why would we expect it to be anything less given its fundamental mission is to protect and defend colonial imperialism? As Dr. Paul Buchanan noted, the government simply did not think a white supremacist could be capable of this, and hence paid much less attention and red flags emanating from these guys. Well, it's not that long ago, as Tummy shared with you, when the intelligence services of this country exhibited their mission through the invasion of Tuhoi lands and other activist communities <coughs> around Aotearoa. And I'll include activists here in the Manawatu. It included the harassment of Fano and descendants here. It included the harassment of Fano and descendants of Parihaka. It included the incarceration of the Uru with the four, Tamiti, uh, Terangi Kemara, Ur Singer, and Emily Bailey. As Tamiti shared with you all a few weeks ago, that came in the form of what is now referred to as the Tuhoi Raids where Tami and Tuhoi have worked through a process where they are seeking to move forward from the 2007 raids, it appears that there has been little shift in how the intelligence services operate. <clears throat> in 2017, on the 10th anniversary of the Tuhoi raids, Erds and Emily Bailey made the following statement. Families across Aotearoa are still dealing with the aftermath of the raids 10 years ago. The trauma, the anger, the hurt and the financial pressures in particular, we want to draw attention to the traumatised children who received no counselling and are still suffering 10 years on. What we must remember is that contemporary trauma for Indigenous people is layered over the existing historical trauma, and on the, which on the whole remains unacknowledged both internationally and in this country. The invasion of Tuhoi territory in 2007 was 100 years after the Tohunga Suppression Act of 1907. The Tohunga Suppression Act was designed also to legitimate the oppression and suppression of tangata whenua, and in particular of Māori knowledge. The intention was not only designed to deny access to healing or rongoa, it was an act that was designed to oppress and suppress Mātauranga Māori and any or all attempts by iwi to keep control of our own knowledge and our own well-being. Now, 100 years later, 
the chopping, uh, the suppression of the suppression of terrorism act in 2002 also showed that it served as an attempt to silence Māori activism with the two high raids of 2007. Accusations of terrorism are not new to the Māori activist community. Many of our great leaders have been accused of being terrorists, have been threatened and have been imprisoned for acts of resistance to colonial rule. Acts of colonial invasion have been justified through colonial fictions, such as the doctrine of discovery, through race hierarchy, and embedded through a Darwinian-based notions of survival of the fittest, through class suppression, and through the imposition of capitalist systems of production, and more recently, what Graham Smith refers to as the new formations of colonization with neoliberal economics. Each of these oppressive acts have been developed, maintained, and reproduced as a means for the justification and ongoing perpetration of oppressive systems. Acts of genocide, ethnocide, enslavement against indigenous people, black people, and people of color around the world remain a major significant trauma for those communities. And as Angela Davis has always reminded us, they've been central to the supremacist global assertion of capital systems of both abuse and exploitation. And I'll tell you all there's very little talk in wider society about race. And even though, ra even though racial ideologies are part of the structural arrangements of this country, Wally Penetito wrote, New Zealanders are not comfortable talking about race and racism. Nowhere is this more obvious than in official education discourses. The avoidance of racial issues is a part of maintaining a dominant myth of Aotearoa having good race relations. There are many organisations that work to maintain the we are one people mythology from the 1840s in order to continue the marginalisation of Māori. So the idea is not new to Aotearoa. This involves... Uh, Johnson states that critical colonial race discussion is imperative in any analysis of race as a defining notion since early contact. This includes engagement with and critiques of myths that found notions of racial superiority as a way of continuing to promote white supremacist practices here. This can be directly connected to the ongoing refusal of the Ministry of Education to have history of the colonial land wars taught as a compulsory component of our history education curriculum. When in 2014, a group of students led by Leah Bell and Waimarama Anderson at Otahanga College began a petition calling for statutory recognition of the land wars and the need for greater understanding. They talked about their intent in creating the petition as being in reference to the grief and pain buried in the unspoken history of our land. So where does this bring us in terms of a conversation or a discussion of decolonization of institutional space, such as the university? Institutional spaces that have been built on the backs of stolen land, on the back of Raupatu. How do we talk about decolonization or indigenizing spaces inside organizations that have often provided the exact theoretical and research justification for the ongoing denial and oppression of indigenous peoples? How do we disrupt these institutions? How do we call universities to account for generations of not paying the rent. I raised a similar question at Victoria University in 2016, at a time when they were in the process of selling the lands at Kororo campus, lands that had been transferred to Victoria University for $10, and were eventually sold for $28 million. In 2007, the Ministry of Education sought back sought to buy back part of the Kaori campus under the Public Works Act. Victoria was one of 25 institutions that applied for transfer of land. Massey was one of the other 24. Buying the land from the, from the ministry at Hokufitu for the minimal transfer fee of $10 and selling for what is estimated to be around $43 million. 
the only mainstream university, Pākehā Whitestream University, that I'm aware of that is expected to pay lease to tangata whenua is that of the University of Waikato. Waikato Tainui are the landlords as a result of the work of Te Kotahi Mahuta in the treaty settlement process. The land on which Waikato University stands was returned to iwi. However, even with Māori as the landlord, even as, with Waikato Tainui as the landlord, even the University of Waikato is resistant to paying market rental. So what does that tell us about the commitment of mainstream, white stream dominated universities in this country, where at the very fundamental level of the land upon which they stand, there is little meaningful or substantial contribution to the hapu or iwi. A critical part of understanding where we're going is knowing where we've come from. So do we know the history of the universities that we work in? Do we know the role that our universities have in shaping policy? Do we know the role that our university departments have in informing Crown developments? Do we know the hapu of our land that we stand on, on our campuses? Do we know the history of what happened on those lands? How do the institutions speak about this history? Linda Smith, in her thesis in 1996, raised the issue of the confiscation of lands from Ngāti Awa, Waikato and the North in the establishment of the University of New Zealand. At that point, many challenges were put to universities around being more upfront around the history of the land on which they stand. So I looked at the history of Massey University. It appears that the land, the beginning of Massey University, that prior to there being an agricultural college in Palmerston North on this land, nothing else happened. We have to ask ourselves when we're decolonizing, talking about decolonizing the academy, which of our universities, in terms of mainstream universities, have ever made a commitment or indicated an interest in decolonising the academy. I was reminded by your VC uh, yesterday that Massey has a treaty-led policy. But I still have yet to hear any VC at the university or any CEO of a mainstream, conventional, higher education institution ever say that they are committed, committed to decolonising the academy. So universities, as we know, are sites of trouble, and they have been since our development. And there are many sites that their struggle happens. There are also radical possibilities that can happen, from the development of Ngā Mōtia Tia by Apilanga Ngata to provide evidence of Māori literature through to organisations such as Ngā Tamatoa. These are all radical possibilities that happen within these spaces. Cheryl Smith refers to the university as a colonial institution where upon entering the university, Māori students and staff become acutely aware that the university is not exempt from racism or from acts of colonial imperialism. It's a site that she notes <coughs> also provides radical educators who are concerned with creating strategies of resistance, liberation, and strategies of space. So the way in which struggle happens within universities is often contradictory. It happens on multiple levels, culture, language, structures, staffing, access, retention, resources. These are not new. They all derive from a history of colonial education. Much of that history, which remains not revealed or unspoken of within our own institutions, including within this institution. Similarly, the history of the University of Waikato tells us it began with two men on a farm, which is really strange because Waikato Tainui would tell you a very different uh, history of the lands upon which Waikato Tainui stood.
So I'm using uh, you know, examples of institutions of what, that I've worked in or that I'm alumni from. So given the colonial beginnings of the university system and the dominance of monocultural ways of operating, it's not surprising that being a Māori academic can bring us into conflict with our institutions as a direct consequence of differing views. In his coil, Tamiti talked about the need to create our own space. He said, I don't think we should wait for the system to create our space. We have to be creative and create our own space. I think there are different levels and stages that can be a part of it in the same conversation that I'm talking about and how do you get to this institution to support or have a collaboration with tangata whenua. And so you have to go to the nitani and tōna hapu where the kōrero is and the knowledge is. He also said in response to a question from the floor around the system, I don't want you to go to the system where you are beaten. You've got to maintain your own mana. He spoke of the need to raise issues, create conversations and build space. That is fundamentally what activism seeks to do, to create disruption, to dismantle if necessary, to decolonize in all forms of relationships that maintain white privilege or the idea that Western Eurocentric Parker defined knowledge as supremacy, to create havoc. Tummy used the terms whakatumatuma, which is to act defiantly, to defy or provoke, and to be outspoken. To tu te puehu is one we often hear, to act and to make a great disturbance, to stir up the dust. This was also a similar conversation that was held a couple of years ago as a part of the Kingitanga Day panel at the University of Waikato, when a panel of Ngātama Tōa shared their, exper their experiences of what it meant to be young Māori student activists. They also made it very clear that there is also there was always room for new Ngātama Tōa. It's been strongly advocated by Māori academics that central, a central struggle within the university is one of creating both space and conditions for Māori knowledge to be engaged. The notion of space for Māori and institutions is very broad. When engaging an idea of space, we're referring to physical, cultural, spiritual, spatial and temporal concepts. In the university context, it also serves to relate to the constructions of knowledge, theory, disciplinarity, methodology, positionality and status. Creating space for Māori then within the university must happen on all of those levels. That puts a considerable challenge in front of Māori academics within university structures. Linda Smith argues that in fact the structural struggles are critical to creating space. Graham Smith in his 1999 uh, PhD thesis talks about the need to have both structural and cultural components to our analysis. So we're talking about both structural notions and agency. Changes over the past 30 years have been dominated by neoliberal economic models that seem, have seen an even deeper entrenchment of the kind of notions that certain knowledge have more legitimacy and value. As scholars and researchers, we have a legislative wrong as critic and conscience of society. <coughs> How do we do that then when we're seeking to dismantle the exact system that the universities themselves are founded on? What is the role of Māori and activist academics in making meaningful structural and cultural changes? As Jenny Lee Morgan notes, our work is never only intellectual or cultural, it is also political. A neoliberal colonial system expects that we engage in the university in ways that Graham Smith refers to as the privatised academic. As such, it's critical <coughs> that we reflect on our own positionality. To not do so is to deny the embedded hegemony that is dominant within this context. 
Graham's challenge, and you are very fortunate, Massey, to have him. And I say that, having worked with Graham for 30 years, and if you are, I'm off, I'm off text here, but if, if this university is about a meaningful change in terms of treaty-led, which is tertiary-led, then you are very fortunate to have him come out of retirement to come here. What Graham's always reminded us is that if we don't reflect on our own positionality, we deny the embedded hegemony that is dominant within the context within which we're located. His challenge has always been a kōrero whakatūpato to us within the academy as Māori. It's a cautionary reminder that in our role as academics, we need to be constantly awake to the neoliberal agenda that treats education as a private individual commodity that produces the privatised individual that seeks self-gain and does not contribute to a wider agenda of collective well-being. The competitive market nature of the reforms since the mid-1980s have culminated in many things for Māori in the university system. <coughs> the downsizing of many Māori studies offerings, the reduction in Māori staff numbers across the country through non-replacement and through white streaming practices that on the whole are denied by most universities. The increased commodification of labour through the PBRF process and the further stratification of that labour within tertiary systems through the definition of what constitutes an output. This is further exacerbated by an obsession with international, predominantly white recruitment. University restructuring, restructuring has in some play, uh, cases seen a backward movement of the positioning, <coughs> sorry, positioning of Māori schools or faculties, with, for example, the Māori and Pacific Studies at Auckland being rejoined as a school. And at Waikato last year, the new divisional plan advocating the change of status of the, Māori, of the Faculty of Māori Indigenous Studies to be returned to that of the school within the Division of Arts, Social Sciences and Law. That decision was only reject, reversed after significant Māori student staff and community rejection. So what do we mean when we talk about or when we speak of decolonising the academy or indigenising the academy or being a treaty-led university? What does that look like? How do we dismantle the colonial system of education that has informed all government-led education in the Shia and in this country? A system that has been founded, was founded in 1816 with the opening of the first mission school in Langihaua in the north. The civilization, civilizing assimilatory intent remains a critical central part of the existing dominant education system. What is the role of the academic of the activist academic, of the Māori academic, of Pacific Nations academics, of people of colour, of Pākehā allies and of other activists who join, can join knowingly in a process of decolonisation. What does decolonising the academy look like? What does it mean in the many, many layers of a university? That is my question to you. So, now you have to do some work. So on the tables we've got papers. I think it's really important we do some engagement together. And I want for you to either grab, go to that table or grab some papers and go into groups and answer that question. What is your vision for a decolonised academy? What does that mean for you? And I want you to be aspirational. You know, this should not be about having one more Māori staff member in a school. And we know how hard that is, to get one more Māori staff member when you're the only staff member in a school. But if you could think, what would Massey look like in 10 years' time as a decolonised, te led institution? 
what would that be? Um, so our Rupu just discussed that, um, of course, um, the academy would be free, uh, most probably not funded by the government if we were, decol if we were decolonised, uh, that Te Māori would be a norm, um, including te reo, uh, marae, and of course the appropriate staff and resources in order to action that. Uh, there would be a historical understanding of a knowledge and awareness um, throughout the academy. And the graduate profile of the, of the students would also reflect uh, that they know their history in Aotearoa and the world at large, and also they know their place within that. Uh, collegiality might be something that is accepted um, as uh, a means of, um, a, which includes an ethic of care and manakitanga. The curriculum, of course, would be decolonised, it would be transformational, it would be relevant, it would be indigenous, it would be holistic and integrated. And our structures would reflect um, kaupapa Māori, um, shared power, runanga-style decision-making, tikanga and kawa, and we would be well connected with whare wānanga. Um, also, uh, just following on from a conversation I've been having with um, my child is that the potential for um, Farekura graduates uh, to have a place in the academy as teachers, as curriculum developers, as, des as decision makers, um, and definitely as um, to have enough resources by which they can conduct their entire study in Te Reo Māori. Kia ora. Okay, who's next? If you'd like to hand it to uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor Smith, he can take it away for his future <laughs> reference. <laughs> yeah, I think we should all just give this to you. I have given. Uh, kia ora, everyone. So we just kind of did a big brain dump about all our ideas, and um, I'll try and make sense of it all. But we really started with the promotional stuff, and we thought we need to change the promotion criteria and make it so that. Things that Māori do as staff members are, are recognised and, and will kind of give us that opportunity to get promoted. Uh, we talked about the teaching and learning space and maybe not even using that word, you know, ako, and what we do there, how we learn, what we learn, that will get more uh, positive outcomes for our Māori learners. Uh, we talked about spaces and others have talked about this as well in terms of normalising te reo, tikanga, matauranga, uh, you know, having a marae on every campus, and I've talked about that forever and a day. It would be lovely to actually see that happen. Uh, we also talked about mana whenua being visible across all layers within our institution, and having new disciplines. You know, if we could, if, if everything was possible, we could have so many new disciplines that have got those things at their core. Um, competencies would include a wider range of things that we can do and get acknowledged for and we would just see a whole lot of changes and differences. You'll probably see changes, differences throughout all of our kōrero. I'd like to get rid of that word difference and normalise it. So it's no longer about being different, it's just about this is normal, this is what we do. that everybody else has said, so, so pretty much. Um, in the centre for us ended up being this idea of Mataranga Māori being um, equal, but actually having that power and being seen in that way. Uh, but also for something that was important was that prioritising of the way that things are done in terms of dismantling, and one idea that we had was the way that lecture theatres, lecturers can see everybody in a the lecture theatre but no one can see each other and that that has no place in, in our aspirational university, that has no place anymore, because then that brings everybody together. Uh, we also talked about having the competencies across all of the departments for people to be able to submit into their Māori, because um, that's not there, and uh, that means staffing, <coughs> to be really exciting. And 
Then we got into the whole idea that this has to start way back at school. Uh, and so that our whole structure of the way that things are schooled in terms of te reo Māori um, and history, complete change, so that we're not trying to catch people up when they get to university level on these things that should be a no one. Uh, on that last point there. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've seen, I'm a second year mature student, so I'm dealing with that. But I've seen uh, Māori people come in and struggle with the academic language. And I, I feel like they were probably confident in, in their learning, but not necessarily with that adjustment to the big words. It's not that they can't learn that, it's that adjustment. I struggle with that as well. And while there's support, there's websites, there's pages, there's not a lot of interaction mm. one on one with that aspect. And I think that's a, bar a barrier to a lot of people coming on board. So we had that we needed to support storytelling and oral tr transmission and oral ways of learning uh, in a way that would then mean that the academy was not elitist. So. Sure. Is there another one? Who's was that on the wall over there, on the pole? <coughs> is that one of ours or is that someone else's? Ah. Kia ora koutou. Um, we ended up being around a table that was pretty much teachers. So uh, <laughs> you can imagine what our conversations were like and uh, it was pretty much about educational pedagogy. So um, the likes of uh, understanding and acknowledging te ao Māori as a foundation, you know, um, if we're heading in that direction, that was quite a big talk. Also, um, Tariti-based teacher training, which is quite a big, big move. And of course, it's a bit of a, it's been a spoken space at the moment within, you know, uh, within government areas. Uh, research projects honouring Matau Ranga Māori and Tariti practices so, and values. So a lot of those kind of things came out through our conversations. Um, yeah, and also looking at the historical accounts. So from an educational point of view, from let's say a secondary, even primary, you know, talking about our histories. So talking about um, Parihaka, the land wars, and you know, actually, it's they're conversations we don't have with our tamariki. So, um, I think they're really important. And also even at the ECE, engaging with tangata whenua in the preschool land. So having those conversations. and so they close down, that that's not necessarily the way that we should be looking at the way we value things, you know, it's about the, the, the internal kind of learning. That was the, what's the first one. Um, we talked about a revision of the curriculum to incorporate more traditional values. So, um, we talked about also the revision of the modes of learning, so I think similar to some other people have talked about here, just looking at uh, the structure of the lecture theatre and one person standing at the front delivering information and just looking at breaking down that uh, situation. Um, embedding university into the community. So um, I guess Massey is a particularly tricky one because it's physically way up there and, and just, just embedding it more in the community so that, um, that we have uh, uh, you know, kind of breaking down of boundaries physically. Um, but also dismantling boundaries in the curriculum. Um, so, and, and the recognition of learning, so that uh, learning is valued more than just getting a piece of paper at the end, so that's going to go back to that profit model. Um, and also between the idea of um, lecturers and students, so uh, that everyone holds knowledge, so having more kind of communal conversations um, with people as well. Um, and also in the future, we're really lucky university that has, uh, has, a cul has no culture of um, self-censorship and fear. If we take the teachers uh, group, really uh, what we get from that is that we have to dismantle education. 
from the beginning. And are we brave enough to do that? As decolonizing the academy is not only about universities, it's about the whole way in which the society operates. It's about uh, living in a land that continues to deny history, that continues to deny, that continues to see treaty settlements as more important than treaty honoring. Uh, you know, so when we're thinking about our own institutions, we are in a contextual frame where we need to think about the things outside of our own institutions. And so uckle was a term. If we're talking about uckle, we're in an entirely different pedagogical approach. Entirely. Everything about uckle tells us that we're relational, that we're relational with each other, that we're relational with our land, that we're relational with our world. So why do we even have universities that are confined to buildings? Why are we not dismantling some buildings? And actually, Massey, uh, because you have cohorts and you have block teaching, you have this capacity to do that outside, anywhere. It doesn't actually have to be in this whole framework of what we call a university. So what do we talk about when we talk about disciplinarity? Are we, do we want to tinker with our disciplines? Do we want to create new disciplines? Or do we actually want to critique the notion that disciplinarity is a totally foreign idea to a notion of mātauranga and ako? Disciplinarity silos knowledge in ways that, go, that, uh, that cut out people in particular spheres. So we don't have any universities, to my knowledge, that have an ability for students to create their own degrees outside of parameters of disciplinarity. And it seems like a really huge thing, but there are universities around the world that do that, that have, you know, purely, you know, in their view, kind of liberal arts degrees where you create your own degree. Um, <coughs> Evergreen College and Olympia does that. Well, you create a degree that's not determined by, in order to do law, you have to have level one this and level two this and blah, blah, blah. You actually remove the disciplinarity. That is a Western construct of knowledge. Disciplines enable us to have power over fields of knowledge. And they enable those in power to maintain the power over those fields of knowledge. <coughs> and one thing that has really hit me in my own experience in the past a um, couple of years is that I had just completed the supervision, and it's not about me, it's about the kaupapa of disciplinarity. I've just completed the supervision of two Māori women Doctor of Laws. So one who's just graduating on next Friday <coughs> got her Doctor of Laws with no amendments, no, no changes. I'm not a law faculty person. I'm not legally trained. So how could I do that? Well, I had trust in her knowledge of her discipline. <coughs> and we pushed the boundaries of it. So disciplinarity is something that we also need to think about in terms of dismantling. But what, what I don't see on the uh, <coughs> papers, and I think it's a reflection of how nice we are, You know, manaki tanga is something that we really take to heart and aloha. And sometimes I think we take it so much that we try very care be very careful not to offend anybody. And actually, when I was writing this, I wrote a few other things um, <coughs> excuse me, that I took out because I thought, if I'm going to be a good guest, maybe I should just tone that down a little bit. Um, and I think that, you know, that is something we do think about as Māori when we move on other lands, you know, either other iwi lands or indigenous lands. We have messages, but we also have to remember that we're manuhiri. But I don't see <coughs> stop all racism. I don't see stop white supremacy. I don't see challenge, uh, you know, white privilege and entitlement. You know, I don't see you know, have a Māori BC. I don't see... You know, some of the things that actually are quite fundamental to decolonising the academy. So we write it in other ways. We talk about... This is not a judgement. This is a reflection. And <coughs> it's something that I've had to reflect on in my own uh, academic pathway, which has kind of been like this 
like most of us, kind of come into the academy and go out, and come in, and I've got to get out again. Um, you know, so we have to think about our own languaging. And, you know, in my pathway in the academy, I've been really fortunate. I've had 30 years of Graham Smith and 30 years of Linda Smith. I've only ever had one supervisor in my entire academic life, and that's Linda Smith. She supervised my MA, she supervised my PhD, <coughs> and nearly all of our supervision meetings were over either really good food or really, really strong coffee. Um, and, you know, and I've been fortunate in the academic genealogy that I've been able to follow. And when we reflect on our history, we also have to reflect on our own, the own relational relationships we've had in our pathway. Who's informed us? How have they informed us? There are many other people that have informed my work. But I was fortunate as a new academic to be a part of a group of people who are all committed to each other. So how do we bring meaningful whanaungatanga into our work? How do we change an institution that is fundamentally about individualised uh, gain and degrees and qualifications to be more relational? No one said we should not have any universities. They should all be wānanga. I mean, that would be my ideal for decolonising the academy. They'll all be wānanga and they will have meaningful treaty relationships with the iwi on whose land they are and the iwi whose people come into the space because iwi send their young people and older people uh, and actually for Māori it's more older because we're a mature age group into their spaces so how do we facilitate that? How do we facilitate uh, a treaty relationship that is meaningful at the level of the councils that oversee these organisations? So the structural and the cultural framework happening and working simultaneously with each other. And so it means, you know, being brave, but also being aspirational. It means creating spaces in our own little areas that we're in. It means finding good friends, finding good academic friends in your spaces. People that are there no matter what, people that are willing to stand up for change with you, no matter what. <coughs> and trying to keep healthy <laughs> as you do it. Um, so I did want to say one other thing that's around the promotions thing. Promotions have been the bane of my life, really, in my entire academic career. Um, so I'm not a professor, I'm an associate professor. Um, and that was after a number of very full-on conversations. Uh, so as a result of not being a professor, I've now resigned my position at Waikato, uh, effective of July 1. So, you know, promotion seems like uh, a relatively straightforward process, but actually in a neoliberal context, what is valued and what is not valued tells us a whole lot of things around the colonial nature of the institution. So in terms of all of these many layers, you know, we really do need to work together in terms of making change. So I want to thank you all for your contributions. They're all going back to Graham's new office. And, um, <coughs> and it was done intentionally so, so he would have some work to do. Um, <coughs> And I want to thank, again, I want to thank the Centre for inviting me to be a part of this series uh, and all of you for, for coming today. Tēnā koutou katoa.
very um, strong context because only a year or so ago, a judge, a High Court judge, decided that the Murray owners of a site where there had been a huge massacre were not entitled to interfere with the rights of the public using their property free of charge. The person concerned had been arrested, handcuffed and charged with trespass. He was acquitted and a High Court judge quashed that acquittal and ordered him to be retried because the Omari owners were not to interfere with the rights of the public using a lake and land where there had been a massacre of several hundred people. And I sent that email to the Prime Minister and the Police Commissioner the day before the massacre. And I'm in trouble with the police. So this is where, I'm not academic, but I'm learning about Māori um, Pākehā. My, my ancestral home was Palmerston. I'm learning that you cannot use tikanga. I actually sent an email to the Prime Minister the day before and said, you are criminalising treaty rights and there will be utu. And I'm in trouble with the police now, so I'm just letting you know that Murray Tikanga is not valid, valued in this country. I actually said to them, you've reneged on your treaty rights. You have criminalised a person, for honor, a direct treaty descendant, for, for experiencing. Your High Court say that you're not even entitled to British law where, where um, you're acquitted. We'll quash the acquittal because we don't like the judgment. And we'll have you retried. I ended up paying $42,000 to defend a treaty descendant's right to undisturbed possession of his own land where there'd been a massacre of several hundred people. And I'm now I'm under investigation for using the word utu in an email. So what I'm saying is it's all very well to tinker with, with academia, but I have had no support from academia whatsoever. We need, if we're serious about um, decolonisation, we need to be able to have use of Māori tikanga without being threatened with arrest. And I'm using it in my terms because I use the word utu in an email. Kia ora. You know, the threatening of arrest and, and the actual incarceration that's been happening for 250 years. So, um, yeah. So, but I think that, you know, that if there's anyone in the room that, you know, can support, then it'll be good for you to make contact. I mean, also just, you know, it's a part of the wider conversation we have, I was having around, um, you know, that this is <coughs> about a wider decolonising agenda that we're talking about in terms of treaty rights and in terms of a fundamental honouring of te tiriti or waitangi within this country. So. One question. <coughs> Tēnā koe, uh, Associate Professor Yoni <laughs> Pihama. Um, I actually wrote Professor Pihama in the Facebook post because I truly believe that that's what you should be. So just wanted to acknowledge you and and everything you do and all of the spaces that, you, that you're in. I know for me as, um, as an academic and also on the rugby board, I really get inspired when I read your posts and it, and, and it G's me up again and gets me motivated to go back into battle and, and do what I can in those spaces. So I just want to say thank you. And hearing you say that you might be available after July, <laughs> I'm just wondering if, if you want to join us here at Massey University. Kia ora. Yeah, I had someone text me. <laughs> Well, kia ora everyone. I haven't got a question, but I, I guess I'm standing up not to, and I'm very careful about this because I used to be good looking once, and <laughs> not to um, co-opt uh, Leonie's space today, but, but to uh, actually stand up and support, on the one hand, 
and defend myself on the other hand. <laughs> so as the uh, DVC here at Massey, um, uh, thank you very much for all the contributions that, that you've made uh, in this session. I, I do want to say that um, a couple of things which really support what Leonie has said. But the first thing is that self-determination de self begins with the self. And so if we're talking about uh, decolonizing, and actually I don't like using that word. Apparently there's a well-known book on research about this sort of thing. <laughs> and I must read it sometime. <laughs> but um, I don't like talking about decolonizing as a concept because it actually puts the, decolon the colonizers at the center of the conversation. So I want to talk about myself, about what it is that I can do, what we can do. I think that's a focus when, uh, when I, I say that self-determination and beginning with the self is a really important step for all of us uh, to get to that point. So it means that we need to confront our own minds the way we think and our uh, intellectual engagement from that standpoint as a beginning. Um, and really, that was what Kaupapa Māori was about. It was about the validity and legitimacy of our own ways of thinking and our own knowledge, our own culture, and our own frameworks as being significant. So, um, and, the, and, and I think the other point that's... Uh, being made here, although not over said overtly, is that education is important. And there's a relationship uh, here between, I guess, the high and disproportionate levels of social and economic underdevelopment that impacts Māori communities in the first instance, but other communities as well and the need to uh, engage in education. That is, we will not have a revolution in the socio-economic condition of our communities without a prior or simultaneous educational revolution. That's why it's important to struggle over education. That's why Leone's taken time to be with us today to engage us in our thinking about how we might move forward more productively, not just for ourselves, although it begins with ourselves, but with the outcomes that might make significant difference in our communities. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you, Mohan, for organising uh, this occasion for us and, and for, our, for our university and our small steps as we uh, head towards... Um, uh, bigger and brighter aspirations related to a Tiriti led uh, institution. So, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Smith. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Leoni Pihava, for your inspiration and for being with us today. A big round of applause.